in the yard sale you find um, this, or you see this broken down old chair, and it's, it's like it had a, here's the word I like to use, Deb and I were walking through a hotel the other day, and it's like, it's an old one, you know. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it has a former glory. <laughs> and this chair looks like it has a former glory. And it's like one person sees a piece of junk, and another person sees, oh man, gold. You know what you could do with that? Look how ornate that is. What if you just, right? That's what I want to talk about today. So there was a confirmation from the Lord. <clears throat> so grab your Bibles, turn with me to John, the very last chapter, chapter 21. I want to talk about the restoration of Peter. And I want to admit to you right up front that um, I've preached this passage probably, I, I touched it here before. I don't know if, as I've ever really preached through it, but the 21st chapter of the book of John is about Peter uh, and Jesus coming and seeing him restored. And I've preached it a number of times in the past. And the truth is, I, I've probably preached some of this wrong through the years. And so I want to bring some corrections to myself and to give you guys hope about what it is this passage of Scripture truly is about. So there's no slides, so let me just tell you, uh, there's three points to my sermon. <clears throat> Write these down. And then you can fill the stuff in as we move along, okay? So I'm going to talk about God's inconceivable goodness. Inconceivable. How many of you are, like, uh, fans of The Princess Bride? How many of you have watched that more than ten times in your life? <laughs> Don't you just love Inconceivable. <laughs> Sorry. If you haven't watched it, get it. It's... It's so much better than so much of the trash that's out today, sorry. But anyway, this, my second point's going to be, leave some space, unexpectedly personal. God is inconceivably good. He is unexpectedly personal. And my third point's going to be overwhelmingly merciful and gracious. Overwhelmingly merciful and gracious. <clears throat> so, let me read. I'm going to start in the 15th verse. We'll cover uh, some of the stuff in verses 1 through 14 in a minute here. But this is what the word of the Lord says. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, <clears throat> Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. <clears throat> he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Jesus said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you, Jesus said to him. Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, Peter, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. <clears throat> Sometimes we misunderstand the purpose of conviction in our life. We misunderstand what God is doing when he comes to us and he speaks to us. As I told you before, I, I really can't count the number of times that I've sort of misunderstood this passage. We know that if you've been in church any length of time, if you're new to church, I'll fill in some gaps. But if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard this preach that because Peter denied the Lord three times, the Lord came and stuck his finger in his face three times to remind him of his sin. And he was basically saying, look, you denied me once, so I'm coming to you and I'm going to say, hey, do you love me? Well, you know I love you. 
And you know, you know I love you. Uh, and that's not enough. So he says it again. Do you love me? Why? Because Peter denied him twice. And then he said it again. Do you love me? And Peter's greed. And there's, there's the point at which we say, yeah, see? See, Jesus was there to point his finger at Peter, to convict him of his sin, make him feel grieved about his sin, and motivate him to become a better person. You ever hear it preached that way? Not, I'm telling you. As, as we have challenged each other this year to take off the lenses of some of the ways that we've grown up in the church and put on those lenses of grace and mercy and begin to see and re-see the way that Jesus truly does minister to us, the way the Holy Spirit truly does minister to us, and begin to see with a different set of lenses that encompass the love, the grace, the mercy, the kindness, and the goodness of God and his prophetic desire to call forth the very best in you, those are the, those are the lenses we need to relook at this story with. <clears throat> so, there's a misunderstanding sometimes. The purpose of conviction is not to make you feel bad about yourself. Put on the new lenses. Jesus came to Peter to restore him, not to judge his failure. Amen. Write that down. That's why you left a space. Jesus did not come to point out Peter's failure. Do you know why? We'll tell you. Because the enemy was already beating Peter up with that. <clears throat> That's why Peter was grieved. He wasn't grieved because Jesus was making him feel bad. He was grieved because he was partnering with a lie. We'll get to that in a few minutes. I really do believe you'll see something here that will transform your life. How do we know this? Jesus said, he said it himself. He said, I did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to bring what? To bring life and life more abundantly. There's so many passages that... You, your pastor has preached in the past. 30 years I've been at this, man. And, you know, you, you leave Bible college and you just got this kind of like prophetic edge to you. And you, you want to just tell everybody what's wrong with them. And, you know, you know Jesus came and he died for you to change your miserable, sorry, no good for nothing, sinning carcass. <laughs> right? And some well-meaning guy goes, yeah, that's right. You got a prophetic edge to you. No. That's an Old Testament prophetic edge. We prophesy on this side of the cross, on this side of grace, on this side of an understanding of his mercy and love. Jesus said it himself. So here's a thought I had. How much personal, okay, I'll use a big word, sanctification. Let's just draw a line through the word now. That's for you. How much personal work does it take to get into God's good graces? None. You can't do it. You can't. We talk about you're saved by grace, so there's salvation, and then there's sanctification. That's our job, right? That's the grinding out, checking off the... No, no. Because Paul, he greets us as what? Saints. Who are sanctified. In other words, it's finished. It's done. It, you understand what I'm saying? Here's the perfect example. Jesus was crucified, right? And there were two people with him at his crucifixion getting crucified with him. Remember the story? Two thieves, right? One on his left, one on his right. Jesus in the middle. How much work, how much of the process of sanctification did the thief that went to heaven have to do to get there? This, this, this was the first passage of scripture I ever preached on. God gave me a nugget. I preached on it in Bible college in my homiletics class. That's 